Our scripture reading for this morning is from Romans 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. I was expecting a big gold chain and maybe rolling through in a tank or something. And then at the end saying, I pity the fool who doesn't show up here to meet me at the piano. <laughs> Amen. As soon as you said the A-team, I had that song going as a child. I thought, I love the A-team. So, so amazing. Thank you for that. Today, uh, we'll continue... Uh, into our series, The Romans Road to Glory, as we look over Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And the title for you today is Alive in Christ. Okay, where's all, where's all City Church kids at? Let me see you really quick. City Church kids, stand up. If you're in grades kid through five, let me see you stand up. Hurry, hurry, stand up. Stand up, let me see you, let me see you. Okay, this is what I want you to do for me, okay? Because sometimes parents, they fall asleep in church, which is not a good thing, okay? So I need your help, okay? Anytime you hear me say dead to sin, you are going to say alive in Christ, okay? Let's practice. Dead to sin? Let's try over here. Dead to sin? How about right here? Dead to sin? Dead to sin? Let's try over here. Dead to sin? There we go. And all together, dead to sin? There we go, okay? So whenever, I want you paying attention so that when I say it, you can wake up some of the parents that are here, okay? Got it? Very good. Thank you. So just a small recap on the letter to Romans, okay? Uh, as we heard about in chapters 1 through 5, uh, they deal with the sinful position that humanity is in, right? Humanity is dead, and catch this, in sin, but through the work of Jesus Christ, his work on the cross, that brings us into a new life with the Father, okay? That work would be called justification, because sin can no longer be passed over, it has to be dealt with. And so Jesus became the atonement for our sins. Now, many people believe that God had some type of heart transplant in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, he's viewed as this wrathful God who is out to destroy everyone who looks at him wrong. And then within the New Testament, we see all of a sudden that God is this God of love. And he wants to hug us and embrace us and run to us. But no, I want you to understand that the New Testament continues. There is no new God. He is the same. Scripture tells us he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. In the New Testament, we see just how wrathful God can be. We see that full demonstration upon the cross in which Jesus becomes the atonement for our sins. And because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, we have been justified in the eyes of God. Isn't that good? Amen. Justified meaning God looks at us as if you and I had never sinned before. That is the wondrous and glorious power of God. Because of his work, we have been made new. We have been declared righteous. And so from here on out through chapter six through eight, the apostle Paul 
is going to speak to us on this idea or the doctrine of sanctification. Now, remember, at one time, we were dead in sin. Oh, kids, you, I think you're the ones who fell asleep on me. Dead to sin. Right? We were once dead in sin, but now we are dead to sin. How beautiful is that? At one time, yes, we were dead in sin, but now we are dead to sin. And that is the beauty of this gospel. That is the beauty of this letter that Paul is going to expound for us. And so before we begin, let us pray. Savior of the world, you are righteous, just, and a faithful God. You have promised reconciliation and fulfilled your word. Through your son Jesus, we are dead to sin and alive in Christ. We thank you that sin no longer has authority over me. Holy Spirit, work in my life and help me to live according to your word so that my life will bless your holy name and bless those that you have placed in my life. Amen. Perhaps you've heard of this character. The name's Bond, James Bond, right? I've always wanted to say that before. The 007 special secret British agent who saves the world with his license to kill. He's given such a status in order to achieve his mission goals. In other words, anyone who stands in his way has been given the green light. He doesn't need to seek permission because of this license to kill in order to execute anyone who gets in his way. Now, for those who may have read Paul's letter, especially in Romans 5.20, they may have thought, and some did, and acted upon it, that Paul was essentially perhaps giving them a license to sin. The idea was the more that one sins, the more one would experience the grace of God. Now, I don't speak Russian, but there was a Russian monk by the name of Gregory Ruspatan, who believed that the more you sin, the more you can experience the grace of God. So what did he do? He encouraged sinning. The church does not have a license to sin. Okay? In fact, we had our sin card burned up, and now we have a mission to live for Christ. Now, this is the issue that the Apostle Paul is going to address by introducing sanctification to live for Christ. This is important to Paul because, one, he cannot have a church that is divided on the issue. Paul believes that the church should be one body. And when the church cannot get along, there will be problems that will occur. And the church in Rome was no different. We read in Acts 18, 1 through 2, that we're told that the emperor Claudius had all the Jews expelled from Rome. This left the church in Rome to be made up of only Gentile Christians for about five years. When the Jews were allowed back into Rome, Jewish Christians returned and found a church that looked more Gentile than it did Jewish. And so, of course, this brought great contention. The Jewish Christians argued about the Gentiles not keeping the law, such as circumcision and the Sabbath and dietary laws. And these doctrines were of great importance to the Jews because it set them apart as Jews. And, of course, the law advised them on what was right and wrong. The Gentile Christians, however, never lived under the law. So to put these practices or to adopt these practices seemed more like Jewish cultural markers. And so the church in Rome was not in unity. And instead of coming together in order to worship the Lord and break bread together, they argued over who was right and who was wrong. And so again, 
The Apostle Paul, he addresses this issue because in Romans 5 through 20, we're going to read how some may have interpreted this license to sin. And it reads this, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sin more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. The Jewish Christians may have interpreted what Paul said in Romans 5.20 and thought God is definitely giving us a license to sin, and this cannot be. This cannot be, Paul. We don't understand what you mean by this term grace. And so Paul is going to clear this up and expound beautifully on this idea of grace, this new life in Christ in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And so, with that, Paul asks a rhetorical question at the end of 521. And here's what it reads. Well then, should we keep on sinning that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? And the answer is what? No, right? And he says, of course not. The obvious answer is no. We do not have a license to sin. We don't have it. And we, we hear this answer, but how do we overcome sin? How do we overcome these habitual sins? And Paul reminds us again that this is not a work that is ours, but it is a work of God's grace upon us our lives. And that grace is found in Jesus Christ. And here's what Paul has to say. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Now, I love this part because Paul is bringing up some things right here that are very profound. Again, as you heard me mention, the truth is that at one time, you and I, we were dead in sin. Very good. Amen. We were. There was a time in our life where you had no power, no solution to your issues. And you know what? You didn't care. Humanity did whatever it wanted to do and made itself its own God. We were in bondage and we were bent for destruction. And so we look at this and we see again that when this takes place, because we were dead in sin, we no longer had any control over our lives. And so Paul, in chapter 5, introduces the concept of Jesus being the new Adam. The first Adam, or the old Adam, brought forth sin, death, the law, and the sinful nature. But the new Adam, or Jesus, brings forth righteousness, life, grace, and the Holy Spirit. Paul tells us we have died to sin, therefore we can no longer live in it. Okay? Because we have died to sin, we no longer live in sin. How do we live then? We live by the Spirit of God. You and I, we no longer have the power of sin over our lives, and we can say, amen, thank you, Jesus. Sin no longer has power and dominion over your life. No longer are you dead in sin, meaning no longer for those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they've accepted this, this faith in their life, no longer are they sent for destruction. No longer. You have become alive in Christ. You can now say no to sin. No longer does the power of sin have any hold on you. You are free from sin. And the reason is, again, not because of your strength, but because of the power of God. Paul writes, or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. 
And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. And what is amazing about all this is that baptism was, again, as an accepted practice by both Gentiles and Jewish Christians, and we saw a baptism take place here today. Paul is reminding them of the beauty of baptism, the power of baptism. The commentator James Edward writes, baptism is the act of faith wherein God communicates the effects of Christ's death and resurrection to the receptive heart. We have died with Christ on the cross. And we have been buried and risen with Christ. You see, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2, he writes, In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. The Apostle Paul understands this idea of baptism. And as the Israelites were being led out of Egypt... The Red Sea opens up. God makes a way where what? There seemed to be no way, right? It was an impossible feat. Now, you can look at all these discovery channels and they'll say, well, Moses knew the way. And so maybe he found this patch of land that wasn't as deep. And, you know, when the winds came through, it kind of dried it up. No, God opened up the sea. He has the power to do so. And so he opened up the sea. He did this wonderful work before their very eyes. And they walked on through on dry land. And so the Apostle Paul has this idea as he's speaking about this. And what is the importance of it? They're walking away, not in their own power, not in their own mind. They had nothing. They could not stand up to what the slavery that was taking place in Egypt. But by the grace and power of God, they were set free from the bondages of Pharaoh. And they walked through the Red Sea. To a new life, to a new way of living, no longer in bondage, no longer in sin. And that is the same thing of what baptism does for us. When we are baptized, it shows us, it teaches us, it reminds us that we have a new life with God. A new life. We are dead to sin and alive in Christ. Jesus was raised by the glory of the Father. And think about that. To die on the cross, to be raised from the dead, how tremendous and powerful and glorious is that act. That he has power over death, power over the grave. And how wonderful that that is. And now you apply that because that's what the Apostle Paul is saying to us. That we have been buried but also risen with Christ. And that is why we have power. Glorious power. To have victory over sin. That is why. Because of the glorious act and power of God. That is why. We have been buried with Christ and we have been risen with Christ. And this is why we can live new lives for him. Now there are three things I want us as people of God to settle in our lives. The first thing is you have a new identity. You have a new you. For the past couple of weeks, I've been harping about how sinful we are. Sinner, 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 sinner. In Christ, we are no longer sinners. We are saints. We're saints of God. We are children of God. And how wonderful that that is, that the old man is dead and the new man has risen and that you are a new creature in Christ. St. Augustine reveals his struggles 
with his new identity in Christ and his writings of confessions. He speaks about a house divided and he's not talking about the University of Texas and Texas A&M. He's not talking about that. But he's talking about that he wants to do right, but he constantly finds it difficult to. He finds that, you know, he takes this observation that I can very easily grab something with my hand immediately. I want this book. I can pick up this book. I don't even have to think about it. I just, I can pick it up. See how fast that was? It just, I want to pick up this book and I can do it like that. But then he says that doesn't happen with the will. Somehow with the will, when I tell myself, I know I shouldn't do this or I know I shouldn't go that way, I struggle and my body just doesn't want to do it. And he speaks about that. His, there's this house that's just divided between the physical and the spiritual. If this is you, or perhaps maybe you struggle with some type of habitual sin. You make promises on Sunday in this very house of worship. You promise today I will stop. Today I won't do it. I promise God you go home feeling victorious. And then you get all alone and hours later you find yourself doing the thing that you promised God that you would not do. And then you spend hours, sometimes even days in regret and shame, and you feel almost like your life has been thrown in a dryer where all you're doing is just tumbling around in the same old cycle. How do I know of this? I've been there. You begin to wonder if you really are a Christian. You begin to wonder if not, God really does love you. Did God really meet me? Did God, did I really have this experience in this relationship with God, and we begin to wonder these things. And let me start by saying, let me encourage you, my dear brother and sister, that you are not alone. You're not alone. These things take time, but they also take work. And that is why it is so important that you continue to come to church. It's so important that you become equipped It's so important that you read the word of God. It's so important that you pray. It's so important that you worship the Lord. You have to install these new habits or disciplines into your life. You need to be involved in the life of the church. You need to be discipled. Meaning you need another mature Christian who can walk alongside you in this life. Someone who can help guide you, who can love on you. Someone that you can confide in. Christianity is not a solo journey. It's not. And here at City Church, we're working on developing discipleship pathways. I encourage you to make new relationships. Go to a chosen group that we have throughout the week. Go to the prayer group. Attend a Bible study. Meet with others in your home. It's going to cost you something, but you are worth the investment. Your family is worth the investment. Your wife and your husband are worth the investment. Your children are worth the investment. There are people in your lives that are worth the investment, but it's going to cost you your life. It's going to cost you. But before you begin all this, you, you have to have something settled in your heart. And here's what St. Augustine had to say. It reads, I probed the hidden depths of my soul and wrung its pitiful secrets from it. And when I mustered them all before the eyes of my heart, a great storm broke within me. Somehow I flung myself down beneath a fig tree and gave way to the tears which now streamed from my eyes, for I felt that I was still the captive of my sins. And in misery I kept crying, how long shall I go on saying tomorrow, tomorrow, why not now? Why not make an end of my ugly sins at this moment? 
I was asking myself these questions, weeping all the while with the most bitter sorrow in my heart, when all at once I heard the singing of a child in a nearby house, whether it was a voice of a boy or girl, I cannot say, but again and again it repeated the refrain, take it and read, take it and read. And at this, I looked up thinking hard whether this was any kind of game in which the children used to chant words like these. But I could not remember ever hearing them before. I stemmed my flood of tears and stood up telling myself that this could only be a divine command to open my book of scripture and read the first passage on which my eye should fall. So I hurried back to the place where I had put the book down containing Paul's epistles. I seized it and opened it, and in silence I read the first passage on which my eyes fell. Not in reveling and drunkenness, not in lust or wantonness, but in quarrels and in rivalries. Rather, arm yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Spend no more thought on nature and nature's appetites. I had no wish to read more and no need to do so. For in an instant, as I came to the end of the sentence, it was as though the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. I marked the place with my finger and closed the book. You converted me to yourself so that I no longer place any hope in this world but stood firmly upon the rule of of faith. What has to be settled in our lives is that your identity is in Christ. It has to be settled. My identity and who I am is in Christ. You are new in Jesus. That is who you are. You're new, a new creature. You have a new identity. You don't have to struggle about how am I going to make this work? God has already done the work. It's settled. It's done with. Now we have to do the next thing, which is what? The second point, a new walk. Right? We have a new identity, a new you, and now we have a new walk, and that is sanctification. Now, justification and sanctification, they go hand in hand because we're justified. We live out that justification in Christ. We have a new life, meaning we have a new heart. Jesus is not content with a behavioral change. It's not about changing your behaviors. It's about changing your heart. He wants a heart change. Amos encourages us in his in his letter in, five, in chapter 5, verse 24, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. The hands and feet. And just like a river flows and flows and flows should be how we conduct ourselves, not because of, oh, this is something that I should do, but because of who you are. Because I am a child of God, I act and I conduct because this is who I am. This is who I am called to be. You see, we've heard the good news, and now we must act upon it. The word to hear in Hebrew is shema. To shema means not only to hear the words coming into your ear, but also to embrace those words. Meaning, we listen to them and we also do them. Jesus tells us that those who not only hear these words but do them is wise. City Church, we must be a people who desire to Shema. We hear and we do. We practice what we preach, we talk the talk, and we walk the walk. And that talk and that walk is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. And I was going to flex, but I might rip my jacket. (laughs) So I won't do it. And to what? To love your neighbor as yourself. And how do we do this? Again, it's it's through discipline. 
You can only know the truth if you hear the truth. And I spoke on it earlier about being a part of the life of the church. And it just doesn't mean this building. It means the people. You're the church. And lastly, I want to end with this. We have a new family. So we're a new, we have a new identity, right? Say new identity. We have a new walk. And now we have a new family, right? And this is based on unity. Unity is so important to God. Because one, Christian unity displays a beautiful relationship between God and his people and God's people to each other. Secondly, Christian unity is a witness to the world. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, prayed for the unity of the church. The Gospel of John gives us a beautiful account of Jesus' prayers that express unity in relationship and unity as a witness. Jesus prayed, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Christian unity displays a beautiful relationship. It's beautiful. And when there's not unity, there's some things that kind of get messed up. Parents, have you ever had your child come to you and say, can I go to the movies? Or can I get a cookie? Can I get some ice cream? And you say, no, you can't have that. And then later on, they're walking on by, they have a cookie and some ice cream, and they're on the way out the door to go to the movies. And you're like, didn't I tell you that you weren't allowed to have that? And what happens? Well, I just asked dad and he said, yes, right? Kids, you want to know how I know that? Because I did the same thing as a kid, right? That's what happens when, when we're not in unity, right? One person says one thing, another one says the other, and the next thing you know, it's like, what in the world is going on here? Nobody enjoys chaos. You all have to be on the same page in unity. Everything has to look as one, Okay? Adam, when he speaks of the unity in marriage, when God blesses him with Eve, he says, at last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. How important it is to be in unity. It's important. Okay, Marine Corps story. Really quick. Okay? Marines, we, 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 we all look the same, right? High and tie haircuts, uniforms are the same, everything looks good, everything looks at unity. And the reason for that is not just because, yes, that's the way that we're supposed to do things, but it's supposed to show an enemy of how unified we are. How unified. It's supposed to show our discipline. If you have somebody who walks in and their boots are unbloused and their cover's one way, right? When you, every time you go to a fast food restaurant, right? And you see somebody there who's giving your order and like their shirt, their tie's like this, right? And their jeans are down low and they have their hat turned sideways. How can I help you? Right? What are you thinking? Right? What are we thinking about that? If you walk into a dentist's office and like all the equipment's dirty, and, you know, the, the dentist is, like, falling asleep as he's doing stuff. I mean, right? What are we going to think? What are we going to think? Anybody? I'm going to get out of here, right? There's something about looking put together. And so one of the things that we used to do as well as the Marines that we used to do is we would pack our packs all the same way. Okay? Everybody. This is where you're... This is where your extra boots went. This is where your extra skivvy socks went. This is where your uh, extra batteries would go. This is where your first aid kit would go. This is where your extra this would go. All this was the same. Why? Anybody take a guess? The reason for it is, is one, in darkness, you're able to find your things. But in two, if for some reason, if you couldn't find your pack or you went down, somebody else could easily get into that pack and know where everything is. 
They don't have to start, oh my goodness, where's this and where's that and throw everything out and dump it out. They know exactly where everything is. Why? Because we're in unity. And guess what? It saves lives. And so, it's a beautiful relationship. And lastly, unity is a witness. Jesus says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. We sing a song here at City Church. You shall know them by their love. And at that, I'm going to ask for our music ministers to join us. I don't know if they're going to sing that song. If they do, that'd be really amazing. (laughs) But the world is looking for stability, City Church. And this church should be the model of that stability. One of the beautiful things about City Church is that we're a melting pot of Christian believers. We all come from different Christian denominations. Some of us here were raised Catholic, others Lutheran, others Methodist, Episcopalian, Baptist, Pentecostal, Charismatic, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, and so many others. I mean, City Church has two pastors from completely different backgrounds. Pastor John, the Episcopalian priest, and myself, what I have coined the, the so batmatic, Southern Baptist charismatic. <laughs> and how amazing is it that we can come together and worship the Lord together? It's a beautiful testament of this church. Something that I'm amazed by every single time I walk into these doors. I'm amazed by it. It's a testament of the love of God that we have, but not just the love of God, but the love of God for one another. You see, because what Paul dealt with was these Gentile Christians, these Jewish Christians that were just going at it. I'm right. No, I'm right. No, you're wrong. No, I'm wrong. Instead of remembering that we were all sinners, instead of remembering their baptism, that at one time we were dead in sin, but now because of the glory and the power of what God has done, we are no longer dead in sin. We are dead to sin. To remember baptism, to remember, hey, I was baptized and you were baptized. And with that, to remember that we were buried with Christ and that we were raised with Christ. At City Church, we choose to identify ourselves with Christ. And this is what we all have in common. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Jesus is our King. When we come to the table, we choose to remember that at, that, at a time we were all equally sinners, saved by the love of God. And so as our prayer partners come up, It is Jesus that unites us. It is Jesus that we show to the world that we are in unity. If there is ever a disagreement, don't harbor it. Don't allow it to fester, but rather choose to have a discussion with the understanding that we are all part of the body of Christ. Remember that the goal for us is unity. Because one, it shows the beautiful relationship between God and us and us and others. Remember that you have a new life. A new life that was paid for by Jesus Christ. And to remember that you have a new identity. You are no longer under the power of sin. Leave that burden here today at the altar. Leave it here. Don't take it home with you. We have prayer partners that are here that want to pray with you, who want to love on you, 
who want to encourage you, who want to stand with you. And I invite you at this time to come and to pray and to reflect upon the glory of God.